Ed and Rose's horrifying story began many years before. In 1969, 28-year-old Fred West was married to his wife, Rena, with a young family of his own. But he had his eye on a 15-year-old girl named Rosemary Letts. Rose and her family had recently moved to the Gloucestershire area, whereas Fred was born and raised in the local village of Muchmarkle. Well, Fred was the, the eldest boy in, in the family, and he was very much the, the target for, for quite a lot of, of abuse at, at the hands of, of his mother. So his mother sexually abused him, essentially, and he lost his virginity to her. And the family was a very self-contained one. Rose's childhood was similar to Fred's in many ways, in that it was completely dysfunctional and, and antisocial and, and abnormal. So she was abused by her father, who started raping her from, from a very young age. So, so what she took to be normal, what she took to be acceptable in terms of behaviour within a family really was anything but. Fred pursued Rose. He was used to getting what he wanted. When the couple met, there was instant attraction. Rose lived in the same village that Fred had a caravan. They met at the bus station in Cheltenham. She said that he could charm the birds off the trees, even though his appearance was shabby. He had not very clean teeth. Well, these were two incredibly damaged people. They'd both come from, from abnormal families. And I think when they met, what they saw in each other was something familiar. So they both would have realised that the, the childhoods that they had were far from normal. But with one another, they felt that familiarity. Maybe it was something that Rose gave off implicitly, but something in Fred connected with what had happened to Rose and the way she was and the way she'd been treated by her father. And it was like a union of two souls. But I think it was the perfect storm. You know, the chances of these two people meeting was, you know, it must have been a, a million to one, but unfortunately they did. By 1970, just a year after meeting, they were living together in Gloucester with Fred's stepdaughter, Charmaine. His wife, Rena, was nowhere to be seen. Rose was pregnant with the couple's first daughter, Heather. I think in the early days, perhaps the more dominant partner was, was Fred. He was older, he was more experienced, he'd, he'd seen more than, than Rose had. You know, she'd come from this incredibly contained family. But I think as their relationship developed, um, she started to find her feet and find her confidence. And, and I don't think that Fred ever really trusted her. For Rose and Fred, it was all about sex from the very, very beginning. Fred was the originator but he found the perfect sorcerer's apprentice, the perfect partner, someone who shared his lust and someone who understood him and wanted to perform for him. I think we have a lot of trouble making sense of, of Fred and Rose's relationship and the reason for that is because we are people with emotions and normal feelings and, and ideas of what acceptable and unacceptable boundaries are around relationships. So I don't think I'd describe their relationship as, as a, a loving one. Fred and Rose's traumatic childhoods had a lasting effect on the couple and their twisted approach to family life together. Two decades later, it's 1992 and Gloucestershire police are searching for Heather West. In 1987, aged just 16, Fred and Rose's eldest child vanished from the family home. Fred had claimed Heather had run away, but she was never reported as missing. But after receiving allegations of child abuse at 25 Cromwell Street, detectives began to look into Heather's whereabouts. Chief Constable Tony Butler was in charge of Gloucestershire Police. One of the children uh, told a friend at school about what was, what was happening to her. That friend talked to a patrolling police officer, in fact, about what her friend had told her, and it was a result of what the police... The police officer then took that back and it initiated a child protection process, which led to the evidence being gathered. Five of the West children were placed into care and the police began their investigations. They were interviewed about the darker side of their lives at 25 Cromwell Street. What it brought to light was a family joke. And the family joke was a simple one. You better watch out, because if you don't shut up and stop causing your dad or your mum any trouble, you'll end up like Heather, two down and three across in the patio. Fred had laid a patio behind Coronel Street, was in squares, which rather like a crossword. The family joke was that he'd buried Heather at two down and three across. 
this uh, issue, this Heather's under the patio, uh, continued to, to be raised. And so we started to take this point seriously. We knew Heather had disappeared, had, le had left the home, uh, so we tried to trace her. And um, despite massive amount of inquiry to try and find it, she just literally disappeared off the face of the earth. In February 1994, the police decided to find out if the family joke was more serious than the children realised. Armed with a warrant, they began to dig under the patio of 25 Cromwell Street. When they arrived with the warrant, Fred and Rose were at the house and they went into the back garden and the officers started uh, digging the garden. Sensing the end was nigh, Fred asked to be interviewed by police. Fred asked the... Um, the officer if they could go down to the police station and so they, they left fred said that he uh, that he admitted that that heather's remains were in the garden but the police were looking in the wrong place and later that day he returned with the officers and he indicated where um where he thought heather was buried the following day officers digging in that area recovered a femur um, and uh, that was taken for examination by the forensic pathologist who confirmed it was human remains and uh, that turned out to be, uh, to be one of Heather's uh, remains. Rose was being questioned at Cheltenham Police Station when the news reached her and her solicitor, Leo Goatley. When Rose was told that Heather's remains had been found, she gasped loudly and was very distraught. How do you interpret that? Was that a mother's shock and distress, or was it a murderer's distress at being found out. At that time, I, I believed that she was shocked and distressed and that uh, she didn't know that the extent of Fred's activities. And of course, at that stage, it wasn't about serial killing, it was about Heather. But of course, the thing unraveled pretty quickly with the excavation. The police found more than they'd bargained for under the patio at 25 Cromwell Street. When they found remains, they found not just two legs or two thigh bones, but three. The interrogating detective said to West, well, unless Heather had three legs, there's another body. Ah, oh, yes, Fred says, without drawing breath or hesitating, that must be the other girl, that'll be Shirley. The police were about to unearth all the secrets that Fred and Rose West had been hiding at 25 Cromwell Street for over two decades. Secrets that would shock the entire nation. On March the 5th, 1994, the world's media had descended upon the home of Fred and Rose West in Gloucester. Police had exhumed three bodies from their back garden, their daughter Heather, Fred's pregnant lover Shirley Robinson, and missing teenager Alison Chambers. Now detectives were moving their search inside the property and began excavating the cellar at 25 Cromwell Street. We started the excavations in the cellar. It was a difficult place to do excavations and uh, we had to be very careful about recovering the bodies. And on the first day, we did find two sets of human remains. One turned out uh, to be Teresa Siegenhaler and the second uh, remains were Shirley Hubbard. It was clear to pathologists that much had been done to try and hide the identity of all the murdered girls. With Fred and Rose's victims, one of their hallmarks, as it were, was that the fingers and toes were removed. I think we can hypothesize that there may be different reasons for that. Uh, simple cruelty would be one, but obviously we, most people know that fingerprints are a very good way to identify somebody. So removing them, particularly in the 60s, 70s, 80s, before DNA technology was really recognised, would be a way to limit the chances of that person being identified. And that was one of the big, uh, one of our difficulties in, in, when we were doing the investigation, trying to identify the human remains, and in particular, uh, Teresa's remains, because uh, there was no evidence she'd been anywhere near Gloucestershire. But we were able to, in liaison with the Metropolitan Police and the missing persons, to, uh, to come down to a sort of a short list of people that it could be. And then uh, through using uh, forensic techniques, we were able to be satisfied that we had identified her, her remains. 
As the cellar excavation continued, officers escorted Fred to a field near his home at Muchmarkle. He told them if they dug there, they'd find the body of his first wife, Rena, not seen since 1971, a year after Fred and Rose had moved in together. Rena and Fred had been married for nine years, but she was never reported missing. So he was taken out to the fields and he pointed out um, in one field fairly close to a hedge line uh, where he uh, said that he'd, he'd, he'd buried uh, Rena Costello. There were now six victims, and back in the cellar at Cromwell Street, even more bodies were being exhumed. Juanita Mott, a former lodger at the house, missing since 1975. And Carol Cooper, last seen walking home from the cinema in 1973. Plus two familiar names the police had been looking out for, Lucy Partington and buried under the family bathroom, Linda Goff. This was a tragedy for these, these young women. I mean, all murders are tragic for the victims and their families, but it was the scale of this, I think, that took the media's attention. I mean, it, it's almost incomprehensible that two people could uh, abduct young women or uh, lure them to the house and subsequently, uh, you know, sexually abuse them and, th and then kill them. I mean, it is on a scale that's almost incomprehensible. By the 8th of March 1994, less than two weeks after beginning their search at Cromwell Street, police had found ten victims. Most of them had been buried two decades ago, when Fred and Rose were at their most prolific. The story of this cold-blooded killer begins over 35 years ago in the picturesque city of St Albans in Hertfordshire. Joanne Dennehy was born in 1982 and began life in a loving and secure family home. Very few could have predicted this bright and intelligent young girl would turn into a sadistic monster with a taste for violence. By all accounts, she was starting off in life with a what we might say is a perfect foundational upbringing. Joanne Dennehy appears to come from quite a normal family. She had a relatively uneventful childhood. She's one of, of two siblings. Um, her, her mother worked in a supermarket. Her father worked as a security guard and for a, a telecommunications company. And from the outside, they appear to be a, a normal family. She had a sister to which she was very close. Uh, they had even developed a secret language. Uh, she, was, uh, she played netball for the school. Um, she was a very <laughs> normal, quite bright schoolgirl. But Dennehy's idyllic childhood was curtailed as she entered her teens. She started to experiment with drugs, she started not going to school, and she linked up with a man called John Trina. Her parents, they were at their wits' end. They didn't know what to do. Uh, they tried to keep her locked up or bring her home from school. The teachers tried to reprimand her. And the more they tried to control Joe, it was Joe saying, stuff you. And it, it was li literally like throwing petrol on a fire. Dennehy and Trina ran away together, embarking on a turbulent relationship. Despite Dennehy's violent outbursts, the couple had two children together and eventually settled in Cambridgeshire. I think quite a lot is made of the fact that Joanne Dennehy misused alcohol and, and drugs, but, but I think she's well aware of the fact that this is going to be discussed, and she knows that these offer quite a convenient excuse for her behaviour and alcohol and drugs and other substances can disinhibit, but that's assuming that people have got those moral standards to begin with, and Joanne Dennehy didn't have them in the first place. A very disturbed woman, she had done a lot of self-harm, of cutting herself and so on. So there were a number of danger signs that this was somebody who was not attuned to society. As time went on, Dennehy's erratic behaviour intensified. She'd cheat on Trina and leave him and their two children for sporadic periods of time. Her drinking worsened and she reportedly began to carry a knife hidden in her boot. I think she's, she's somebody who perhaps has always enjoyed hurting other people. It's almost like she's this crazy scientist and the world is her experiment. 
Finally, in 2009, Trinor took the children and fled from Dennehy, afraid of what she might do next. The company that she was keeping as well, she was surrounded by people who were similarly disconnected. So, so I think when there was no check or filter or break on her behaviour, she was only going to get worse. Dennehy had become no stranger to the local police. She'd been in and out of prison for drug offences and was also given a 12-month community order for being in control of a dangerous dog. In February 2012, Dennehy spent three days on the psychiatric unit at Peterborough City Hospital, where she was diagnosed with a series of disorders. She has had various diagnoses attached to her, antisocial personality disorder, psychopathic personality disorder. And these are our conditions, they're not mental illnesses. And there's a real important difference between the two because people with personality disorders know the difference between right and wrong. They're, they're fully rational, they're in control of what they're doing, but they choose to do it anyway. So she's not somebody who feels bad, who feels remorseful, who regrets things. She does what she wants to do, and she doesn't care about the consequences. By 2013, 31-year-old Dennehy had settled in a small bedsit in Byfield, a housing estate in Peterborough. But the local residents were unaware of her troubled past or her violent nature. One of Dennehy's new neighbours was Michelle Bowles. She was polite to me. Like, but I wouldn't melt, melt on her mouth, basically. She was well-spoken to me and never swore. She was actually quite pleasant, do you know what I mean? I showed her respect. She loved babies. She was excellent with children. Um, I didn't have a problem with her. When I saw her or spoke to her, I said hello. She said hello back. But other residents were not so sure. Michelle's friend, John Chapman, lived in the same building as Dennehy. He was a Falklands War veteran who'd fallen on hard times. I don't know what regiment he used to be in. I should know, because the man of stories used to say. It's just John being smiley all the time and happy and like, nice to know. But John Chapman didn't smile when Joanne Dennehy was around. John was petrified. John came in mind and he said, on several occasions, there's this mad woman moved in. She says she's going to get rid of me whatever way she can. And he was right to be afraid. In just a few months, Joanne Dennehy's threats would turn to violence and John Chapman would be dead. 31-year-old Lukas Slabazewski had moved to the UK from Poland in 2005. After meeting Dennehy a few days previously, he began exchanging text messages with her. On the 19th of March 2013, Slabazewski went to visit Dennehy at one of the houses she was staying in on Rolleston Garth and was never seen alive again. She almost certainly lured this man with the promise of some kind of sexual favour. But without a moment's hesitation, she stabbed him through the chest once, very, very hard, killing him almost instantly. Slabazewski had been coaxed into Dennehy's deadly embrace. She led him to believe the pair were in a relationship. He willingly and naively entered the trap she'd laid for him. Everybody that comes into contact with Joe and Dennehy, it's like falling into a spider's web. And you can't get out. Men can't get out. They become entranced by her for all sorts of reasons. Dennehy had complete disregard for the life she'd just taken. Dennehy puts this poor Polish man's body in a wheelie bin and then shows it to a 14-year-old. And so, look how, how clever I am. I've killed this man in the wheelie bin. But it was only a temporary solution. Dennehy knew she couldn't keep Slabazewski's body in a bin. She had to dispose of it quickly, but she needed help. She called upon one of her friends, 47-year-old Gary Stretch, who was more than willing to assist. Joanne Dennehy is quite bright, she's quite clever, so she's able to exert quite a lot of control in her interactions with, with other people, and that's what makes her exceptionally dangerous. Now, looking at the relationship that Joanne Dennehy had with her accomplices, I think she was able to, to charm these men. She was able to kind of lure them in, really, and they would have been flattered by her attentions. You know, here she is, this younger woman wanting to spend time with them. 
these were men who had quite dull, quite boring lives, and I think they were quite excited to, to get involved in, in what Joanne wanted to do. At seven foot two inches tall, Gary Stretch towered above Dennehy's slight frame. An unsuccessful burglar, Stretch was absolutely infatuated by her twisted and lethal charms. Gary Stretch and Joanne Dennehy met uh, when both of them were on parole from prison for various offences. She realised that she could use him to do whatever she wanted. Um, he was her bodyguard, her minder. Um, and that's how they formed this team, which became so overpowering for Stretch that he would do anything for her. I don't think Joanne Dunn, he had any emotional feelings towards her accomplices whatsoever. They were useful to her at the time, and, and she just cast them aside when she was finished with them. With the help of Stretch, Dennehy dumped Lukas Slabazewski's body in a ditch in rural Thorny Dyke, just 10 miles east of Peterborough city centre. When we look at the, the two attempted murders, you know, towards the end of her, her spree, this is something altogether different. These are strangers, these are men that, that she doesn't know. So I think what was happening here was that she was up in the ante, she was getting bored. You find that psychopaths tend to have a proneness to boredom and a need for stimulation, so, so she was even applying that to her murders. Remarkably, both men survived these attacks. Although their injuries were life-threatening, they were still able to give the police descriptions of Dennehy and the instantly recognisable star tattoo on her cheek. By now, the police sirens are going all round, and blue lights are going all round Hebridgeshire. They're panicking, it's like somebody's kicked over a wasp nest. The local police had been alerted to her spree and were about to put an end to her bloodshed. They cornered Dennehy and Stretch on Newton Close in Hereford. Two officers turn up and they spot this car with Dennehy in it, talking to the dog on the back seat, while Gary Stretch is trying to negotiate stolen property at the front door of one of his associates' house. They arrest Dennehy on the spot. Gary Stretch and one of his friends do what they call in police parlance a runner. They jump in another car and speed off. Something like a car chase goes on for about 20 miles, and then Stretch decides to get out and run for it. Now, Mr. Stretch is not built for speed, and of course he's very unfit and he's stopped. And he turned around to the police officer and said, ah, you've arrested me. Joe and I would have been the next Bonnie and Clyde. Footage of Dennehy in custody at Hannyford Police Station just 40 minutes after stabbing two men and leaving them for dead showed her laughing and joking with the arresting officers. One mark for attempted murder and murder. Attempted murder and murder, what does that mean? So going down for Sunday boats. Joanne Dennehy is like a chameleon. Um, she's become a very accomplished actor, so she will play to whatever audience is in front of her. Um, she can be charming and, and sound very educated and, and literate. And at the same time, to another audience, she could sound quite rough and quite downbeat. So she's, she's really honed these, these skills of responding to, to the people that, that are around her. The following day, April the 3rd, 2013, the bodies of Dennehy's other two victims were discovered just outside of Peterborough. In a ditch on farmland at Thorny Dyke, investigators found 31-year-old Lukas Slabazewski and 56-year-old John Chapman, a close friend of Michelle Bowles. It was a case that spanned two decades, by the time Peter Tobin was found guilty of murdering teenage hitchhiker Dinah McNichol in 2009, he'd already been in prison for two years. He was serving life sentences for the murders of Angelica Kluk and 15-year-old schoolgirl Vicky Hamilton. The 63-year-old serial killer and rapist had buried all three girls across a 15-year period, one in Scotland and two on the south coast of England. Another awful discovery at 50 Irvine Drive. A body bag thought to contain the remains of Dinah McNichol brought out from what was the most ordinary of houses. It is no longer. I think what sets Tobin apart for me is the, the sheer relentless brutality of him. 
a man who genuinely paid no attention whatever to anything but his own basest instinct. He did what he wanted, when he wanted, and could get away with it. Former Detective Superintendent David Swindle from Strathclyde Police first came across Tobin after the body of Angelica Kluke was discovered at St Patrick's Church in Glasgow in 2006. The 23-year-old Polish student had been missing for five days. Coming back to the church today brings it all back to me. The horrors, the horrors of what must have happened here. Unbelievable. You could never imagine it. A place of worship desecrated by Peter Tobin doing what he did to Angelica Kluke. But when they arrested Tobin, police were convinced this wasn't his first murder. David set up Operation Anagram, a task force charged with finding out more about the life and crimes of Peter Tobin. When we looked at his life in Operation Anagram, we found that he frequented places like this, churches, religious establishment, homeless persons, hostels. How many people frequented the places that Tobin frequented. How many people did he meet that were vulnerable at that time, that had no relatives to report them missing? How many of these were missing and were never reported missing that Tobin has killed? We'll never know. Tobin knows the answer. Throughout his life, Tobin, who was born and brought up a Catholic, had a persistent connection with the Catholic Church, and at various points during his periods on the run or disappearing or adopting false identities, took refuge in uh, Catholic churches and Catholic communities. I think it was simply that that was somewhere where he felt comfortable, where he knew how to conduct himself, where he could hide in plain sight. He could conceal his true nature behind the facade of church handyman or a member of a Christian community and that was a very safe way to conceal the reality of what he wanted. To Tobin nothing was sacred. He took advantage of the open nature of the Currens and the community of St Patrick's. He was with his mother about six, seven weeks, something like that. And then he started giving Father Jerry a hand in the church and he's doing bits and pieces. People don't understand you can be with somebody a full day and they never spoke. You know what I mean? People find that hard to understand. There was nothing to sort of, uh, it was a yes and no. That's what it was, a yes and a no. Peter Tobin was an incredibly manipulative individual. He wasn't particularly emotionally complex himself, but he had a really good understanding of other people's emotions. He knew what other people needed to hear and he used that to get what he wanted. Cathy, however, had concern for the ominous stranger who joined their community. I says to Dennis that there was something far wrong with him. I, I wasn't too sure what it was, but as far as I could understand, that the jigsaw with Pat McLaughlin was no fitting together. There was something not right there. But Tobin's next step was more evil than any of them could have predicted. Angelika Kluk was a 23-year-old student from Skotsau near Krakow in Poland who was working as a cleaner in St. Patrick's Church. On the 24th of September 2006, she disappeared. Dennis broke the news to his wife. He said, that girl, Angelika Kluk, we don't know where she is. And I went, what do you mean? He said, she's vanished. All her stuff's there, all her credit cards and everything are all up in their room, but she's vanished. Police scoured the church and grounds for evidence and began interviewing members of the community. They discovered that the last person seen with Angelica was the church handyman, a man named Pat McLaughlin. Charity worker Dennis provided police with a photograph of McLaughlin. At six o'clock it went in the evening news nationwide, and within minutes, the phone line was jammed to say, that's not Pat McLaughlin, that's Peter Tobin. Police now had their main suspect. They quickly discovered that Tobin had a violent past and the investigation escalated at rapid speed. David Swindle was the lead detective on the case. I became involved in the investigation when it was established that Peter Tobin, a missing sex offender, had been with Angelica Kluke. 
And soon after my involvement, I arranged for the church to be searched again by specialist officers and specialist teams. There's a garage attached to the church, and that is where Peter Tobin was with Angelica Kluck working on some woodwork. He called her his little apprentice. He actually was interviewed by a police officer when the missing person report was made. And he stayed there for another day. And when the heat was on, he left. When he realised it was being treated as a major investigation, he left. This is someone that was cool and calculated. Police launched a nationwide search for Peter Tobin. Mr Tobin is considered a potential risk to members of the public. Any person who sees this man is advised not to approach him. It was a name that sounded all too familiar to crime journalist Martin Brunt. It was a shock to find what had happened, but what made it particularly interesting for crime reporters who were covering the case was that police were appealing for a man called Peter Tobin and it rang bells. It took me and others back to the days of 1993. They didn't realise that he was, in reality, Peter Tobin with a dreadful history of sex crimes. He was a man hiding in that community under a false name, had duped the church authorities to employ him as a handyman, and of course they were completely innocent of his background. As the search for Angelica intensified, it became more and more likely she wouldn't be found alive. We had another search of the church, a really thorough search, because by this time, the parameters had changed. There was concern for her safety. Five days after her disappearance, on the 29th of September 2006, police discovered the body of Angelica Kluke under the floorboards of St Patrick's Church. She'd suffered severe head injuries and multiple stab wounds after being attacked in the adjoining garage. It was in there just after the priest, Father Jerry, left on that Sunday. Within minutes of it, someone across the road had heard a scream. He hit her over the head with a table leg. There were splinters in her head, rendered her unconscious or semi-conscious bound her hands with cable ties, further assaulted her, dragged her in a polythene sheet into the church here and across the church and put her body under the floor like a bag of rubbish. She was put under there, he stabbed her, whether that happened underneath there or whether it happened outside, and he raped her. He left her dead. The British public was shocked to learn the truth of where Angelica's body had been hidden since her violent death. This should have been a day of worship here at St Patrick's Church, but instead the building remains a crime scene, sealed off and guarded by police. And today brought the news that the people who laid those floral tributes were expecting but dreading that the body found hidden underneath the floorboards here was indeed that of the missing Polish student. I think the discovery of Angelica's body was awful enough that a young woman had died in those circumstances. The fact that she was buried under a church added some sense of horror and drama to the way people reacted to it. The fact that a suspect was somebody who had been working at the church, somebody who seemingly had volunteered to be a handyman at the church didn't really make sense. DNA evidence on Angelica's body was confirmed as belonging to Peter Tobin, and his fingerprints were found on the tarpaulin he used to wrap her in. In forensic pathology, we have what's called no cards exchange principle. That says that when you interact with another person, you leave something of yourself on them, and you take something of them away with you. Anyone who murders another person who physically interacts with them they will leave trace evidence. They will leave DNA, potentially fibres, hairs, all sorts of things. But Peter Tobin continued to elude the authorities. Despite a nationwide search, he disappeared into thin air. So things were moving very fast. We have the human remains of a young woman who's been ferociously attacked. Horrible, horrible scene underneath the floorboards 
forensic examination is ongoing. We knew by this time that Peter Tobin had a history of violence, sexual crimes. He had been in prison. He was a dangerous person. Where was he? David and his team wouldn't have to wait long for an answer. In early October, just over a week since Angelica's murder, they received a crucial breakthrough. Tobin had been spotted, this time using another alias, James Kelly, over 400 miles away. We got a phone call from the police in London that he had checked into a hospital in a false name. Someone had recognised him. A Metropolitan Police officer went in there and confirmed his identity. And I arranged for a team of uniform officers to bring him back to Scotland. Stephen Greveson was born in Sunderland on the 14th of December 1970. He grew up in a large family and his parents were reportedly violent towards one another. You are molded by the environment you live in. It's, it's, a, it's a fact, everybody knows this. So if you grow up with violence, you tend to be more violent than people that don't. Greveson appears to show some psychopathic traits in childhood. Some of his old school reports are looked at by a psychologist at his trial. And within these reports, they talk of his lack of empathy, about his callousness, about his real lack of emotion towards other people. I think there are a few red flags in Stephen Greveson's childhood, but they're not necessarily red flags that say to me, this person's going to turn into a murderer. They're red flags that say, this is somebody who perhaps needs some help, needs some support, you know, later on in childhood and, and in their teenage years. Growing up, Greveson was often in trouble. And in 1982, he was arrested for shoplifting. He opened a, a packet of nails inside a, a shop. He didn't take the whole pack. He took one nail and he got caught. Um, and obviously the owner of the shop didn't like that very much. And he actually went to court for stealing one nail. One nail, not a pack of nails, one nail. But he was only 11 years old. Extraordinarily, he was taken in front of the magistrate. Now, for most 11-year-old boys, that would be the most terrifying experience imaginable. And they would certainly not dream of doing it again, even though it was, in many ways, absolutely irrelevant, tiny crime, certainly not punishable by anything significant. But it's interesting that Greveson didn't take that experience as any kind of lesson. He simply brushed it off, water off a duck's back. He simply went on and did what he wanted to do. At the age of 13, social services made the decision to remove Greveson from the family home. Well, when he was an adolescent, he was taken into the residential care system and he ends up at a children's home in Carlisle. Greveson's troubles continued through his adolescence. In May of the same year, 1990, Sunderland was rocked by the murder of a 14-year-old boy called Simon Martin. He'd been found semi-naked and bludgeoned to death in a derelict building after running away from home just days before. I remember the Simon Martin murder very well. Um, we had five murders in less than a week in Sunderland. And in hindsight, looking back, whether that was putting extra pressure on the police with a given murder inquiry involving 40, 50, police officers, a hell of a lot of police resources, and whether that would have put strain um, on the, the Simon Martin murder at the time. The police initially thought they had quickly solved the crime after arresting a local teenager. He was 16, he lived nearby. Um, he was a respectable lad from a good family from memory, and he'd been playing in that building uh, with others, and they found his fingerprints in the building. Uh, there was blood in the building as well, and they found his fingerprint in blood, which was just coincidence. All charges against the 16-year-old boy were eventually dropped. The murder of Simon Martin would remain unsolved for 23 years. But during the original investigation in May 1990, police had also spoken to a local 19-year-old man named Stephen Greveson. 
He's somebody who had a reputation in the local area for hanging around with, with people younger than him. And I think when you've got somebody who's trying to, to get a sense of control, get a sense of power, you often feel that they hang around with people who they see as slightly inferior to them. Grieveson was questioned by the police in the wake of Simon Martin's body being discovered. And Grieveson said, yes, I certainly I saw him, but he was fine when I left him. Grieveson was released without charge. Three years later, the discovery of the body of 18-year-old Thomas Kelly would trigger a series of similar deaths that would spread fear across the whole of Sunderland. By the winter of 1993, 22-year-old Stephen Grieveson had built up a reputation as a troublemaker. In November of the same year, Thomas Kelly, an 18-year-old student, had gone missing from the family home he shared with his parents and his sister, Lindsay. My brother Thomas was just a normal boy for the time, just kind, helpful. He would do anything for anybody. Loved life. We wouldn't go to bed on a night time without saying we loved each other. He used to call me Pins instead of Lind's. <laughs> <laughs> which was a bit strange, but uh, that was the way we went on. We argued quite a bit, as brother and sister do, but never went to bed without making up. We were very close as brother and sister. We were close as a family. We didn't have loads of money or nothing like that, but we, we went out and done things together. Silly things like willy picking and, you know, we just... Very close family, I'd say. Lindsay vividly remembers the day her older brother disappeared. I went to school, my mum went to work, and then Thomas had left for college. And that was the last time we'd seen, seen him. It was actually a bit strange that morning because we were very close as brother and sister. But that morning, he was standing by the fireplace in my mama's house, and um, as we said bye, he walked forward and grabbed my hand and squeezed my hand. On November the 26th, 1993, the emergency services were called to a burning shed on an allotment near Monk Wearmouth Hospital in Sunderland. The fire attracts attention inevitably and the body of Thomas Kelly is found. It's hard to imagine what it must have been like for whoever arrived on that allotment to confront the sight of a, a burning body in a burning building. It is gruesome. When I came on the news, I wasn't listening to the news, and I'd, I was sitting in the house, and I'd seen my dad cover his face, and I went, what's wrong? And he went, there's a body being found. And they say parents get a feeling. I don't know where they go feeling at that point. Thomas's badly burned body had seemingly destroyed any possible evidence, and senior detectives at Northumbria Police were not convinced that he had been murdered. Detective Wilson was certain that all three deaths were linked. Not only were the crime scenes extremely similar, all three boys had attended the same school, Monk Wearmouth Comprehensive. In August 1994, Wilson asked for a second post-mortem to be carried out on all the bodies by a senior pathologist. You don't just call a friend and say, oh, can you re-examine the body? No, you have to get, you know, court orders and judges and everybody involved. And this detective was relentless. He went after it and he got the court order that was needed. This is a detective that he knew that something was wrong. You know, when you read a case and, and you just, you, maybe it's a gut feeling or there's something there, you go, okay, this cannot be like this. On closer inspection, all three teenagers appeared to have died in the same way. So in Graveson's case, the most important factor was that the ligature marks are then identified. We're now moving from three similar but apparently discrete incidents, albeit involving three young boys from the same school, to three potential homicides from the same school 
the same way, now you're almost looking towards a serial killer. I think that the fact that Stephen Greeson killed his victims via strangulation is very significant because it's one of the most personal forms of killing. You are watching the life drain out of them. He's probably feeling more in control at the time he's killing his victims than he's ever felt at any point in his life before. So I think it's a very deliberate choice of method. I think they were groomed, encouraged, cajoled, or perhaps even threatened by Greveson. And they paid the price with their lives. I remember the day very well. I was on The Sun when um, Northumbria Police uh, revealed that they were treating the deaths as murder. Um, and tragic as it was, the family would have seen that as a victory, um, that finally something was happening. Detectives had found fingerprints and a footprint belonging to Greveson in the derelict house where David Hansen was murdered. They were from a burglary Greveson had committed months before, but proved he had access to the property. And by September 1994, Wilson had retrieved some conclusive evidence. Semen found in the stomach of the third victim, 15-year-old David Grief, was a DNA match for Stephen Greveson. If you burn the outside of the body, then you can lose injuries. If you lose the skin and the soft tissues beneath it, there's going to be less and less that you can see. But it can be surprising what you can still identify, particularly if the area is protected from the fire. You can still see maybe stab wounds. You can see all sorts of things that many people who try to dispose of a body by fire think will be gone. Greveson was already in prison for robbery after holding up a fish and chip shop. Stephen Greveson was a bully. He wasn't nice. He used to go around picking on lads and taking stuff off them. He picked on teenage boys, old women, anybody that was smaller than him, I think. He was a troublemaker, someone to keep away from. When Greveson was arrested for the murder, we weren't shocked at all, because it was what we were fighting for, for months. We knew it was him. We knew that those boys had done nothing wrong. Mick Philpott was born in 1956. He grew up in Derby as part of a large Roman Catholic family. It would have been an environment in which um, his parents' attention was diluted across many children, so he wouldn't have been the, the centre of attention by, by any means. And we know that his mother worked very hard. Um, she had a job at a, a factory that, that she only retired from when she was quite old. So he didn't appear to come from an unusual background by, by any means. In 1975, age 19, Philpott joined the army. He began to show signs of a violent temper, especially towards his girlfriends. It would repeatedly land him in trouble. Local journalist Martin Naylor recalls the events that led to Philpott being arrested in 1978. When Mick was a youngster, I think, 19 or 20, maybe 21, he ended up with a conviction for attempted murder for which he was sentenced to seven years in prison. The story with that is that he had a girlfriend back in Derby. He was stationed wherever his regiment were. She'd had the temerity to send him a, a Dear John letter ending their relationship, so he decided to go AWOL from the army, rock up at her house in Derby and attack her with a knife. And then when her mother tried to intervene, he, he attacked the mother too. Despite his seven-year sentence for attempted murder and grievous bodily harm, Philpott served just over three years. He was released in 1981. From that point onwards, Philpott set about controlling every woman he had any contact with, and to do so in the most outrageous way. Those who knew Philpott were surprised to hear just how violent his past had been. I know Mick can handle himself, so like, if anyone really was intimidating towards him, he wasn't afraid to pump his chest out and stand up to him and, and so forth. So I know he had quite a strong like, reaction when, when people kind of pushed him. 
the bit that shocked me was um, I didn't know that he tried to kill his uh, ex-partner. After his release from prison, Philpot had a series of volatile relationships. In 1986, at the age of 30, he got married for the first time and fathered two sons and a daughter. He later had two more children with a teenage girlfriend and began to have several relationships simultaneously. By the time he was 50, Philpot had fathered a total of 17 children. This was a point at which Lisa had decided to take control, to take her children and to go to a women's refuge. And the key thing here is that Mick hadn't decided that that was OK. He was the one that decided when relationships were over. He was the one that decided what happened on a daily basis. So the fact that Lisa had betrayed him by taking that power away from him, it was only going to result in, in something really alarming in return. Lisa moving out left financial implications for Philpot. Not only did he lose her income as a cleaner, but also the benefits he received for their children. The custody hearing was set for May the 11th. Philpot concocted a plan to ensure that children would be returned to Victory Road. Out of the vanity and arrogance of the man, together with his wife Maraid and Paul Mosley, the kind of live-in, sometime lover, they hatch a scheme to set fire to the house in Victory Road in an effort to provoke the council to give them bigger house, but also to blame his mistress. She will not get the custody of the children. It is an extraordinary, bizarre plan. I think Maraid was very much under Mick Philpott's control at this point in time. I think he would have um, quite easily have talked her around into actually being a part of this. It was a badly devised plan. To me, what convinced him is his own stupidity. He was self-absorbed. He thought that he was the king. You know, he, could, he got all the girls he wanted and he could control them and everything. And maybe Philpott thought that he was that intelligent, that he, it was that easy to devise a plan that he could get back on the girl. So he probably sat down, wrote down the plan very quickly, this is what we're gonna do, right? Very easy. In the early hours of Friday, May the 11th, 2012, the same day as the scheduled custody hearing, Philpot, aided by his wife, Miraid, and their friend, Paul Mosley, poured petrol through the letterbox and set the family home alight. Six of Philpot's children were sleeping upstairs. The fire that he set, that they have set between them, takes hold at a pace far greater than they could possibly have conceived. And the house is literally filled with smoke in a matter of instants. In his typically vainglorious way, Philpot makes a particularly appalling 999 call, saying, my children are inside. They was on the phone to the emergency services, I believe, and they were saying that my house is on fire and it was like my baby, my baby, and obviously they, they told the emergency service my neighbours, my neighbours here. It was very, like, misty because everything's just happening so fast. I attempted to go into the house. I got as far as the kitchen, couldn't go any further. The smoke was just too thick. It was choking, black, couldn't see anything, so I had to come back out. There was a ladders at the side going up to a window. I tried climbing up to there, and there was a ratchet in the window where Mick's been trying to smash in, I think, and there was smoke coming from that window. I then came back down the ladders, and I climbed up onto a wooden frame what he's been built in onto his conservatory. The damage to the house is drastic, and there is no way that those poor six children could possibly have escaped. Smoke inhalation alone would have been deadly. I climbed up to the window, see if any windows were open. None of them were open. Then I put one of the windows through with a wrench from, from the other window. I chucked out the window. It smashed straight through. I then continued putting the window through with the, the pickaxe on the roof, smashing all the window up. I was about to climb into the property. Again, couldn't see nothing, couldn't hear nothing, and hear no screams. When the fire service arrived, the desperate attempts to save the children continued. The local press soon got wind of the unfolding drama on Victory Road. I was on the early shift on the morning of the fire, and I could hear that the news desk phone was ringing. So I made a bit of a dash for it. I grabbed the phone, and it was the on-duty police press officer. 
and she said to me, we're just letting the local media know early that there's been a really big house fire in Allenton and five kids are dead. Within about five or ten minutes of knowing that it was in Victory Road, I phoned the local news agent who I'd know because I'd done previous stories with him. He answered the phone and I said, Joe Gritz Martin from The Telegraph, and he said, it's Mick Philpott, it's Mick Philpott's house. And I didn't even have to ask him what it was about. He knew and he would blurted that out straight away. Shocked neighbours began to spill out onto the street as the full horror of the tragedy became apparent. I think nearly the whole street was out on the front. Uh, the fire brigade were in the house, flashing lights everywhere. I pushed to the front of the house and I could see the uh, firefighters bringing the children out. Um, some, some in blankets, I think they used the blankets to try and protect them a bit. A bit more. And the ambulance were trying to resuscitate some of them. I was just hoping that the kids would survive and recover. I just um, didn't really know what to think at the time. Didn't know what had happened, didn't know what caused the fire, just didn't know anything. Tragically, five of Philpott's children died at the scene. Ten-year-old Jade, nine-year-old John, eight-year-old Jack, six-year-old Jesse and Jaden, who was just five years old. Their older brother, 13-year-old Dwayne, was rushed to hospital in a critical condition but would later succumb to his injuries. One thing that they don't do throughout the entire press conference is appeal for help. Who set this fire? Who killed these children? Why? Because he knows he did it. It wasn't just the police who were suspicious. Philpott's performance had baffled the onlooking press too. At the end of it, I got in the car to drive back to the office and I thought, that's not right. Something's not right about that. He's not once mentioned the children. He's not mentioned them by name. He's not looked into any cameras and said, please, will someone out there help me find out who's done this? It's a suspicious fire in his own home, and not once has he made an appeal to the public, to anyone who's watching, you know, please, anyone with the information, come forward, not once. So then I got back to the office, and as I walked in, I could see everyone was still stood around the TV, and we all looked at each other, and that was the moment that we all knew, you know, you know, something, something's wrong here. This is a game changer. Disingenuous would be a polite way of describing it. It is typical of a man who believes he alone rules the world. He is an emperor of everything he surveys. He is a man whose vanity knows no bounds, a man for whom he is the center of the universe, which in the end, convinced the police that he wasn't telling the truth, that he seemed so capable of this kind of sleight of hand. He may have convinced himself, but he didn't convince many other people. I think he's such a narcissist, he's so arrogant, and, and he, he thinks he's gotten away with it, that, that he thinks he's invincible. He, he thinks that his act, as he's fooled many women over the years, is going to fool the rest of us, and it certainly didn't. The residents of Victory Road who'd rallied round the family also started to wonder what was going on. Her behaviour was strange. Uh, he did ask me if he, that he, he felt for the police. He said he thought the police was blaming him. He did say that to me. They think he did it and stuff like that. 88 officers working on the case had taken over 5,000 statements from local residents some of which suggested that the police themselves had made more of an effort to save the six children than the Philpots. On May the 29th, 2012, 18 days after the fatal blaze, Mick Philpot and his wife, Miraid, were arrested on suspicion of murder. Ireland's mother struggled to settle down, and by the age of 10, he'd changed schools six times. They had also changed home nine times, including a short spell in a homeless shelter for women and children. And then she met a new husband. They had a child together. 
And they made the decision that it was too hard to raise both these children in the same household. And so he was sent away and put in a home. And the message that gets sent when a parent does that is, you're just baggage. You're not a part of my future. I don't love you. I'll dispose of you when and as I see fit. And this is a really crucial time for our development as children. Our relationships with our parents are absolutely fundamental at this point in time. And when you have an interrupted or a disrupted attachment, particularly with your mother, that has a real impact on your ability to form attachments with other people throughout your life. So you've got all of the ingredients for at least a problematic life, but unfortunately, it's not just problematic, it becomes fatal. Constantly on the move, Ireland regularly found himself as the new boy at yet another school. Witnesses that we spoke to told us that he was picked on at school and uh, it was a bit of a loner, really. He was not a popular child at school. He was bullied by others. And when you have that sense of isolation from your peers and that inability to form those relationships, you do really turn in on yourself and you become very insular, very isolated. And your reaction to others' behavior towards you is maladaptive, it's abnormal. So he would react by being violent, he would react by setting fire to things. So there are some real warning signs here of a very, very troubled individual indeed. In 1966, 12-year-old Ireland found himself a summer job in his hometown of Dartford. At one point, he was working in a fairground, and, and a man propositioned him with, with, with gifts if he, if he had sex with him. We can only, with hindsight, say that they, that may well have shaped his, his, his view of gay men. And often, sexual predators will prey on people like him. So they would have picked up on those vulnerabilities. They would have picked up on the fact that he was the odd one out, that he didn't have much of a support network around him, and, and targeted him for these advances. You have, in this petri dish of adolescence, all these things added together, abandoned, mother struggling in poverty, school to school, bullied, an extraordinary conflation of ingredients that might make a serial killer. And slowly but surely, that reality began to emerge. As Ireland grew up, life didn't get any easier. He often found himself on the wrong side of the law. By the time he was in his late 20s, he'd already accumulated a, a, a fairly substantial criminal record. He'd been in and out of prison for things like robbery, theft, deception type offences. And he became interested in survivalism. Admitted. So. He's an individual who, who knows how to cover his tracks and he's got that in mind from the outset. He was not a teenager or a, an aggressive young man of 22. He was a man who had thought out what was going to happen. And what was going to happen was a spree of killings that was to send shivers down the spine of the gay community in London. As well as a type of victim, Ireland had identified a hunting ground, a gay pub in the Earl's Court district of London called the Colherne Arms. He was confident he'd be able to entice his prey. He'd gone from this kind of skinny youth to being quite a burly, well-built, big guy. He was quite tall, a sort of imposing presence. Obviously, in, in that sense, that sort of sadomasochistic thing, he might have appealed to a certain type of man who wanted to be dominated by another man. With everything in place, Ireland was ready to kill for the first time. On the night of March the 8th, 1993, he met his unsuspecting victim. Peter Walker was a 45-year-old theatre director that Ireland met in the Colhill Arms. They went back to Walker's flat. Peter Walker has two dogs, a Labrador and a German Shepherd. They shut the dogs in the living room and proceed into the bedroom. Peter accepts that sadomasochism is part of the routine that he likes to play, part of the role and therefore allows Ireland to tie him to the bed. 
and Ireland whipped him and he held a plastic bag over his head and suffocated him. With plastic bag asphyxia, you're looking at a situation where it's lack of oxygen that causes you to die rather than lack of blood flow to your brain. And that is a much more prolonged and much more unpleasant feeling. Anyone who's kept their head under a swimming pool for a bit longer than they normally would will know that air hunger, as it's called, that desire to breathe, and knowing that that's not going to be allowed would be a terrible way to die. After killing Peter Walker, Ireland created a bizarre spectacle at the scene. He drapes condoms over his victim's face. He poses two teddy bears in the oral sex position. And this is demeaning to his victim. So he's not just killed his victim, he's humiliated him as well. Uh, and this is something that, that Ireland is doing to say, hey, everybody, look at me. This isn't just a murder. This is more than just a murder. And Ireland's cruelty didn't end there. He set fire to his pubic hair. He said later to see what it smelt like. Well, the poor man was already dead. Why humiliate his body anymore? Ireland didn't flee Peter Walker's flat with any urgency. He spent the night there, cleaning up any evidence that he may have left behind before disposing of the murder kit on the morning train back to Southend. He was thrown cuffs in the Thames or out of the train window and disposed of every single murder weapon uh, that he used to kill or strangle them. So clearly evidence that would be on that. To go home to the flat. After forcing Emmanuel Spiteri to give him his cash card and pin number, Ireland strangled him to death with a rope. This time, the 39-year-old killer tried a new way to hide the evidence. There'd been an attempt to burn the flat. Aye, the furniture had been piled up. He'd clearly set fire to it. Oxygen had run out, and that's why it went out. And very, very fortunately, because it was a top-floor flat, and he could easily have killed people below and, and to the side of it. We know that he's done a lot of reading around cases of serial murder. He's probably got an awareness that fire is one of the few things that will destroy DNA. So I think what's going on here is that he's trying to destroy the evidence that, that links him to the scene. But at the same time, he wants recognition for the crime as well. What he was doing was creating another murder, creating another scene, and, and trying to get recognition, but still maintain that anonymity. Luckily, the fire Ireland had started had gone out and the flat didn't burn down. Three days later, on the 15th of June, Emmanuel Spiteri's landlady found her lodger dead and called the police. They retraced Emmanuel Spiteri's last steps and for the first time got a look at the killer's face. Fortunately, he was captured on CCTV uh, at Charing Cross Station, so we've got Emmanuel, five foot two, in front of uh, Colin Ireland, six foot one, on a single shot just coming out of the tube station. Not very clear of the head, but you can see the build and the height, uh, and clearly you've got Emmanuel in front of him. So that was a crucial piece of evidence. Although, obviously, it was not a piece of evidence which would necessarily confirm that he was the killer, but it was, a, it was that kind of circumstantial evidence on which a case can be built. Armed with the image, the police went on full offensive to try and catch the killer they managed to blow up the image to get something that was, uh, was a reasonable representation of Ireland. They didn't know what Ireland looked like at the time, but it was something that they could use in publicity to attract attention to the case, to circulate, crucially, amongst the gay community. Myself and uh, Ken John did a midnight press conference because we were concerned that people were being too relaxed about it. Uh, we, we gave a description of who we were looking for, and to warn them that they had to be careful because the next one could be you. I think there was a general call out amongst the gay community to be very careful who you go home with tonight kind of thing. There was a great fear, there was great concern. With the police closing in, Colin Ireland decided there was no point in hiding and on the 19th of July, he went to see a solicitor. He decided that I'll, I'll go into the solicitor and he gave an affidavit, he said, that yes, I am the man in the video. Yes, I did go to Emmanuel Spiteri's address, but when I got to the front door, there was another man in the flat. I didn't want to freeze him, so uh, I went home. 
It was too late to get a train, so I slept in a nearby churchyard. Unbeknownst to Ireland, someone from the solicitor's office passed on his details to the police, who already had his fingerprints on file from previous offences. Eventually we got Ireland's name, cross-matched it against the mark, and it was his. So that placed Colin Ireland in the crime scene, uh, and although you can't date a fingerprint, it, it most certainly helped in, in the totality of the evidence. On the 20th of July 1993, Colin Ireland was arrested. On the 22nd, he was charged with the murder of 33-year-old Andrew Collier. The following day, on the 23rd of July, he was charged with the murder of 41-year-old Emmanuel Spiteri. If Colin Ireland had not been caught when he was, he would have continued to kill relentlessly until he was eventually stopped. It is the classic element of any serial killer. They won't stop until someone stops them. And there was lots of work done. We had ID parades, we had voice ID parades, for education and lots of other things. He never opened his mouth for three days. But fortunately, because of the similar fact evidence from the 